Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, students, colleagues, and friends of the university. My name is Holger Janusz. I'm working at the North American Studies Program of the University of Bonn. I welcome you to our lecture series, The White House Embattled, the US Election 2020. I'm especially pleased to welcome Ms. Andrea Rotter from the Hans Seidel Foundation, who will be our guest speaker for tonight. Today, I represent Professor Sabine Silke, the director of the North American Studies Program and the German Canadian Center of the University of Bonn, who apologized for not attending due to her university responsibilities. This event would not have been possible without our cooperation partners, Christoph müller hofstedt and Anna Hoff at the Bundeszentrale für Politische Bildung and Dr. Benjamin Becker and Katharina Kiefel from the America House NRW in Cologne. Many thanks for their cooperation and support. The United States is not only just one, but still the dominant superior state in world politics the so-called hegemon, even if in decline. While often criticized for its engagement, the United States is often perceived as the indispensable nation to solve international conflicts, problems, and challenges around the globe. Because of its important role in world politics, militarily, economically, technologically, and culturally, US domestic and foreign politics receives a lot of coverage in news abroad. However, because of the United States' superior role in world politics and salience of US politics in use abroad, there's a tendency in foreign countries, including Germany, to overestimate and overemphasize the importance of foreign policy for the American electorate. US voters do usually not count foreign policy very high on their issue priority list. <laughs> Nevertheless, Nowadays, many issues such as terrorism, climate change, economic growth, migration, or the pandemic, just to name a few, are necessary link to foreign affairs due to globalization and digitalization. President Trump's greedo, America First, was and is still a central part of his campaign. America First is the idea or a narrative that almost all international and domestic problems are caused by foreign countries and international organizations, in particular China, but also others such as Mexico, Germany, or the World Health Organization. America First expressed the feeling of many American voters that the fact, uh, and the fact as widely discussed in public and science that the United States is in decline on the global stage. Therefore, foreign policy and international affairs are of relevance as a campaign issue for the upcoming presidential election. I'm very pleased to welcome Andrea Rotter in our lecture series today, who will give us more details about foreign policy as a campaign issue in the upcoming presidential election 2020. Ms. Rotter heads the Foreign and Security Policy Division at the Hans Seidel Foundations Academy for politics and current affairs in Munich, where she focused on both German and European security policy, as well as US foreign policy and transatlantic security cooperation. In her current project, she analyzes transatlantic relations in the context of US CENO power competition and increasing militarization of space, and Trump would here proudly mention the Space Force. So before I give the word to Ms. Rotter, just a few words on the procedures. After the presentation, we will have time for a Q&A session, but for now we have muted our audience. We are also recording this lecture in order to make it accessible afterwards. Ms. Rotter, again, many thanks for taking time. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I'm really delighted to I think mostly students, so it's been a while since I gave lectures at the University of Regensburg, but um, I'm really delighted um, to talk to you uh, with you about America's presidential campaign and the role of foreign policy. Let me just get things straight so that you all can see my PowerPoint presentation. Um, okay. So 
can you see it? Yes. Okay, perfect. Let me just, okay, because I don't want to see myself, so I just um, have to sit in the, um, <laughs> the video box. Okay, so basically what I want to talk to you today about is US foreign policy and the presidential race. Um, but before I start the original presentation, um, uh, one thing, one remark um, about, I'm sure in the previous presentations you had uh, in your lecture series, it has been remarked often that actually the coronavirus and the COVID-19 pandemic, that they changed um, not just global politics, but also the presidential campaign. Um, Dick Sherman and Anna Palmer of the Political Playbook, so um, political, political, political magazine of Washington. They have a podcast and they also have a daily newsletter, so which I really recommend um, for everybody, um, especially among students, because you get a daily update on what is currently going on in Washington, D.C. Um, they have been very fittingly said, currently we have the United States of uncertainty. So currently, um, we don't know much about how the COVID-19 pandemic will play out, what kind of influence it will have on the presidential elections. Um, Sherman and Palmer ask, has there ever been this much uncertainty before a modern day presidential election? Probably not. So we have no idea whether the, the, the parties can have actual in-person conventional parties, um, in-person in in-person presidential nominating, nominating um, conventions, whether there will be traditional TV debates, whether there will be remote voting. So right now, um, the United States, but also global politics is in a state of great uncertainty. And this certainty is also reflected in my presentation. So you have to distinguish. And actually, when I show you polls or, or surveys uh, that were conducted prior and and after the COVID-19 pandemic took place, you can see that you know there's actually lots of uncertainty, and you don't know what's really going on or what's going to happen. So when you want to you know predict anything, that was just mere um, speculation. So despite the state of uncertainty, what I would like to talk about is a little bit about the role of foreign policy in U.S. presidential elections. Um, about um, Trump's foreign policy narrative against the Democrats' narrative, if there is one. Uh, I think this is something we could debate after my presentation. Um, then I try to speculate a little bit. So what will be the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic and the presidential elections and what can we expect? And again, um, after the presentation, I really would like to invite everybody to discuss um, how COVID-19 will you know, play out in terms of the presidential election, but especially in terms of um, the, 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 the role of foreign policy. So, um, Holger Janusz already mentioned uh, that in general, you could assume that um, foreign policy does not really play a big role in presidential elections. Um, so conventional wisdom is that presidential elections are not won on foreign policy. And this was quite clearly illustrated, I think, by Bill Clinton's motto, by Bill Clinton's um, presidential campaign slogan, it's the economy, stupid. So basically, uh, the assumption is that domestic issues are way more important to the American voters, especially when you think of American voters in the American heartland, for example, than foreign affairs. Of course, it's always dependent on the specific domestic con um, context. So um, you have important factors which in contribute to the general, let's say, situation of the United States. So you have to take into account the state of the economy. Important indicators might be the unemployment rate, the development of wages, median household income. And in most of these parts, um, I think Donald Trump um, was doing a really fair job. So the numbers in terms of economy, uh, they were really in his favor. So other issues that are very important to the American electorate are healthcare, education, um, the, the debate about inequality and the distribution of wealth, uh, but also you know, daily politics, daily domestic politics also plays into presidential election campaigns. And we could see that when the Mueller report was um, published in April, 2019, or um, the conclusion of the impeachment trial um, in February, 2020. So, Usually, that's the basic headline, um, foreign policy does not really 
ranked that high among voters' priorities. And when we look at um, the overall issue priorities um, of the American voters in 2020, and this is a survey um, conducted by Gallup in January 2020, so pre-COVID-19, um, or before the pandemic really um, took its, um, its toll on the American public, you can clearly see that the most important issues for the American electorate are, with the exception of terrorism and national security, clearly healthcare, gun policy, education, the state of the economy, to a certain extent, immigration, um, whereas you can see that um, global issues such as climate change, for example, or uh, whatever you might define as foreign affairs, apart from um, terrorism and national security, that compared to these domestic issues, actually, um, foreign affairs and foreign policy issues did not rank very high um, compared to other issues. So um, when you look, however, at um, how the different parties see these um, priorities, um, you can see, and this is, I think, quite interesting also for other lectures um, you might have, that actually you have a huge partisan divide when it comes to these domestic, but also to, um, to foreign affairs issues. Um, and this will be interesting when you look at the, at the green column, uh, when you look at the position of the, of the independents, um, that um, both Democrats, Republicans, but also the independents rank different issues um, differently. So healthcare, of course, gun policy, education, the economy, um, you have stark differences between, United, uh, between the Democrats and between um, the Republicans, but the headline would be that in general, um, you can see that there's not just a divide between domestic issues and foreign policy issues, but there's also a divide between Democrats and, um, and Republicans. So in generally, in general, you can say domestic issues are way more important in presidential election than foreign affairs. But of course, there are a few exceptions when it comes to this general wisdom. So um, one professor of the Duke University, I think, put it quite interestingly. So you may not be interested in foreign policy, so you as a candidate, but foreign policy may be interested in you. And what he meant by that was that foreign policy developments and crises can seize public attention during presidential um, election campaigns and then can put foreign policy in a, in a more prominent um, focus and than it would have been otherwise. Um, you can clearly see it, of course, after 9-11, um, when national security and terrorism took um, the stage in, in debates. You can see it um, in, in, in 2008, for example, during the um, primary debates um, for the 2008 elections that especially Afghanistan and Iraq were, for example, dominated some of the um, presidential debates um, in 2012, um, it was the Arab Spring and the consequences throughout the Middle East that dominated, for, ex um, for example, Republican debates. Um, and in 2016, you had the rise of ISIS and um, terrorist attacks also on American ho um, home soil that really um, altered somehow the debate um, about the presidential elections in the United States. And you also had this um, also during this um, presidential election campaign in uh, early this year. Oh, okay, okay, just one more time. Okay, so um, I go back to the, what we had this year. Um, so um, this actually is something um, I took from foreign policy, from, from foreign policy analysis, which really, um, you know, made the effort to uh, to analyze how foreign policy has fared in U.S. presidential elections. And you can see that ever since 2000 and um, ever since um, the terrorist attacks on 9-11, that foreign policy debate question, so the role of foreign policy in presidential debates has actually increased over time, especially when it came to um, 2004. Um, the Democrats um, hugely debated about whether the, the Iraq war, the invasion of Iraq in 2003, uh, was legitimate or not, or how um, the United States um, should further continue down this road. In 2008, you can clearly see that you know, the worsening situation in Iraq and the 2007 surge really, um, really 
um, dominated the debate. So you can see there's some kind of a positive trend uh, when it comes to foreign policy and the role of foreign policy in presidential elections. Um, this is another slide um, from the same analysis um, by, foreign, by the magazine foreign, foreign Policy. And you can see that um, actually um, also a kind of increasing trend, but I think this is also important and this is the general assumption uh, that Republicans or Republicans during the presidential debate um, deal more with global issues than Democrats. But this is also something that might change with respect to the 2020 election. So um, this is another slide I've found quite interesting because it gives an overview um, on what topics really dominated in terms of foreign policy um, topics in presidential debates. And you can see uh, that it's always dependent, of course, of the, on, the, on the political context in which it takes place. So you have for a certain amount of time, um, when always when things get worse, for example, in Afghanistan, but also with Iran or Iraq, that, you know, of course, you know, the, the public focus um, is more on this issue. Um, you can see quite clearly um, that China um, has been um, a topic ever since. Um, so that's not really a new invention by the Trump administration or by the Obama administration, but you always had, you know, uh, faces where we were talking about how you could integrate um, China into the international system. Um, Iran um, fared also very prominently when it came um, to the 2008 um, presidential debates. Um, but I think what you can see for the 2008 um, debate, um, really the worsening situation in Iraq took its toll on the presidential debates and that Iraq and how would you improve the situation or how would you end this war um, really um, dominated <laughs> to, a, to a great extent the debate also in the presidential elections. And um, this is the last slide. Um, you see from this point of view that, uh, for example, after 2012, um, after the Arab Spring erupted in, in the Middle East and Northern Africa, um, that, for example, Syria and the ongoing civil war took center stage also in the 2016 presidential campaign, primarily um, on the um, Republican side. Okay. So, but this is what I actually wanted to talk to about before that um, foreign, po foreign policy actually took a quite prominent role already in ju January 2020 during uh, the presidential debates when um, Donald Trump ordered a strike on, on the Iranian General Soleimani and where, you know, the world was not really sure how this military confrontation between, uh, between the United States and Iran could be prevented or what next step um, the, the Trump administration would take. And as um, the New Yorker put it down there, Trump drags the Democratic primary into a foreign policy fight. So while um, before um, the strike, foreign policy did not really fare among the Democrat, uh, Democratic candidates, um, the, the strike on Soleimani really forced the Democratic Party um, to deal with foreign policy and to deal with the question whether um, you know, how to deal with Iran, also with how to deal with, you know, the authorization of uh, the use of military force, which always has been debated ever since Donald Trump took office and um, Democrats feared that actually he might take um, the, the previous authorizations to wage war against Iran. So you can see that um, actual, you know, events, uh, real politics can have quite an influence on the presidential election campaign and the presidential race. So for the 2020 um, presidential race, when you look, and this is something I found very interesting while doing this research. Um, so again, we, we are pre-COVID-19. Uh, so um, actually last year, um, um, late last year, um, election strategists were um, kind of, you know, considering whether foreign policy could be um, an interesting topic in the respective presidential campaigns and on the Republican sides, um, as stated in this quote, um, people were quite sure that President Trump would tout his record on foreign policy as a resounding success, um, based on, on the notion that when Donald Trump took office with his, um, as Holger Janusz mentioned, with his America First policy, um, um, approach, 
um, that he fulfilled most of his foreign policy um, foreign policy campaign pledges so far. While as, uh, whereas on the democratic sides, um, this America first um, slogan and the policies that resulted in it um, resulted from it actually energized the democratic field. So both parties were considering whether foreign policy could be a suitable um, topic for for the presidential campaign, and both were willing to exploit that idea that uh, on the one side Donald Trump could, can, you know, sell his um, his campaign. Um, promises on the other side, you know, that Democrat would really tap into that Demo America first and um, would actually propose some kind of um, opposite vision of foreign policy. But as I said, that was pre COVID 19, and we still have to um, figure out how this will turn out. So, um, looking towards Trump's possible foreign policy narrative that he will you know, that he tried, but he, that he most likely will also try to sell to the American electorate um, down the road is um, or is exemplified by, by the statement I just have here um, from the State of the Union address in February 2020 this year, uh, where people said, well, it was a State of the Union, but actually it was also, the you know, you could compare it to, all, um, to a presidential campaign, election campaign event. So uh, he was not really speaking um, to Congress, but more uh, you know, speaking to a, to a rally of Trump supporters, you could say in a way. And uh, when you think of what he has done in foreign policy, whether you like it or not, uh, whether you know it was good in terms of foreign policy, international relations, uh, what you must admit with Donald Trump is that, or what you have to give him credit for is that he actually did um, good and most on on most of his um, campaign pledges. So he um, replaced NAFTA uh, recently with the so-called USMCA, a new trade uh, deal between the United States, Mexico and, and Canada. Um, he, um, well, he, he shifted the strategic paradigm uh, from the tr from the Obama administration somehow to you know to the to the return of great power competition although Obama of course you know wanted to to uh, to pivot to Asia uh, the Donald Trump administration put that down in all the strategy documents that we have the return of the great power competition and that actually um, we have to um, you know reconsider our policies with regard to China. Um, in this regard. So that is something that he's likely going to sell to the American electorate that he took a hard line uh, against China um, and so that China would stop exploiting the international system. Um, Cuba, it's not something that we in Europe really talk about, but he undid most of what Obama tried to undo with, uh, tried to do with um, when, it, when it comes to Cuba. Um, of course, military spending is always uh, one thing, not just um, among among Donald Trump, but also with the Republicans in general. So um, in his doctrine, the peace through strength ap approach by investing heavily into, into the defense spending, um, that's something he did and that's something he's going to take credit for um, when it comes to national security issues. Another thing he's certainly going to uh, take credit for, although that's something we can clearly debate, is that he actually thinks he was the one to um, to get NATO allies, for example, to increase more in the military spending. Uh, so this is something that he's going to sell um, among his uh, electorate. Um, then his approach to, or his improve, or his policy to improve relations with Israel, for example, by recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital and moving the embassy to Jerusalem. Um, he will also take credit for, um, um, while not while destroying ISIS in in Syria and in Iraq um, by um, increasing the military force and by, um, you know, um, taking or or bereaving um, the, um, the terrorist organization, the Islamic State, uh, from its territory. The things that he did not mention in his um, State of the Union address, actually, but what he did um, were, of course, his withdrawal from TTIP, uh, from, from TTP, TTP the Trans uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, the Paris Climate Accord, the TCPOA, uh, the nuclear, nuclear deal with Iran, for example, and also he tried to mend um, relations 
with North Korea. So uh, when you think, again, when you compare what he actually pledged to do when he started his campaign and what he actually did, he really did good on most of his promises. And this is something why strategists in the United States thought or think that it might be a good idea for the Trump campaign to actually run on foreign policy more than it had been the case in, in the past. Um, so what is the Democrats' response? And this is part of the problem uh, we had uh, for a very long time within the Democratic Party. Um, so in general, you get the notion that also when it's not just when it comes to domestic politics, but also when it comes to foreign policy affairs, um, that Democrats don't really have a proactive strategy. So one quote says, what Trump said, but the opposite, or the other is whatever it will be, it won't be Trumpism. So um, what these statements I think clearly exemplify is that, of course, Democrats are more or less united in their quest or in their, you know, in their, in their goal to overcome Trump and to uh, get a Democrat elected to the White House. Um, they don't really have their own vision for a post-Trump world order. And um, I've called these two approaches currently in terms, um, when it comes to foreign policy among the Democrats, on the one side, you have the rest, uh, restorationists, and on the other side, you have the 2021 Democrats. So what do I mean, or other authors, what do we mean, mean by that? So restorationists, that is what you might call the general establishment of the Democratic Party right now, um, mostly also among some of the candidates that which, um, ran against Joe Biden in the primaries were um, very keen on restoring the status quo uh, before Donald Trump took office to come back to a more Obama guided um, foreign policy and that was something you know that they wanted to sell or that is something that they actually want to do once they get to the White House. Um, another or in, as a contrast to that and I found that idea very interesting uh, was the 2021 Democrats. And this term was brought up by Thomas Wright from the famous Brookings Institution in Washington, DC. And he makes out a certain circle among Democrats. You know, so you have, um, you have elected officials, um, for example, Chris Murphy, the Senator from Connecticut, he counts um, to this 2021 20, Democratic field. You have um, freshmen to Congress who were uh, just elected in 2018, uh, which um, also want to undo Trump, but not return to the status quo um, of the Obama years. So the, um, so the, defi or the, the, the common ground is the assumption that foreign policy or that international affairs that the world has changed, that Trump might have, um, you know, might, or the Trump administration might actually, you know, have, has, have analyzed, um, you know, the, the, the world um, as it is um, correctly, but that it took, you know, the wrong approach to, to solve the problem. So um, that the general notion is that democratic party also has to change its foreign policy vision so that the foreign policy vision it had over the last 20 years for example that that is not all, no longer valid and actually that um you know you you also have to it's not enough to just return to the prior trump period if you know what i mean so uh, within the democratic party um you still have these you know two poles where you don't know where the Democratic Party and also the Biden campaign will actually end up with. Uh, when you think of um, Joe Biden, uh, what he's currently doing, so his current approach is not so much on foreign policy, but it's more on the crisis management. So foreign policy um, does not play such a huge role in his um, campaign. Um, but you can see also, and this is something I would really recommend for you to read um, when you want to know uh, what Joe Biden actually wants to do or what kind of foreign policy vision he has for the country. Um, he published a, an article in Foreign Affairs uh, just last month or two months ago uh, and where he uh, lays down his foreign policy vision and it stated why America must lead again. Um, and there you can see that it kind of goes along the lines of, you know, what Trump said, but the opposite, that he's more or less trying to, you know, to 
to do damage control. Um, but as um, Thomas Wright from the Brookings institutions, from the Brookings institution analyzes, is actually that this is going to change. So that the Trump administration, uh, that the Joe Biden campaign will, you know, in the in the months to come, very likely um, put forward a more detailed and a more um, you could say, um, not revolutionary, but a more, uh, you know, a different approach from what uh, it has um, advised or what it has put forward so far. So, um, yeah. Okay, so, but the interesting thing is, and this is something why I think it's, why I, I understand why um, campaign strategists actually thought that, uh, especially among the Democrats, that um, that foreign policy might be a very good topic to run during the presidential campaign is that although Donald Trump actually thought that you know he he can you know tick off his whole campaign pledges and which he did of course uh, that actually public opinion shifted more or less um, to you know from America first so there you you had as um, Holger Janusz mentioned you had people who actually wanted that America first approach that that more or less you know I wouldn't call it isolationist but you know the more the more self-centered American policy but when you look at what this policy actually did within the within the public opinion or what effect it had on the public opinion I think it's quite visible that it had you know to to a certain extent a contrary um effect so uh this is a survey done by the um 20, uh, done by the chicago council uh it was published in 2020 so it was conducted in 2019 and you can see that uh, that um actually you know um the majority of the people and it has been increasing um, not just since Trump, but also since 2014, uh, that the United States should play an active role in international affairs. So this is kind of, you know, contrary to the America First um, approach um, to a certain extent. When it comes to security alliances, which Donald Trump, of course, to some extent has, extent has really really damaged, I would say, when he calls, you know, NATO obsolete and and or openly thinks about withdrawing the United States from NATO. You can see that, you know, also the the, the benefit or the, the belief of the American people that security alliances benefit both the United States and um and the um, and the and the partners and the allies actually has increased to a certain extent, certainly in Europe, for example, in the Middle East. So despite you know his um, transactional um, understanding of foreign policy, um, the majority of you know, of American citizens actually think that alliances, security alliances, as we have with NATO, but also as we have in the in the Pacific region, for example, that they're actually for the benefit of both the United States and the partners. And this sentiment actually has increased. Um, another thing, very interestingly, is also you know how people really got to appreciate international trade. Uh, so you know this America first, bring jobs home, and you know the trade war going on. This certainly had a a, a negative effect when it came. You know, so in terms that actually um, actually the um, the understanding for, but also the support for international trade increased ever since Donald Trump took office. I think this is important to know, um, or this is something we have to consider um, once you know COVID-19 is is not over and done with, but once we see what consequences it will consequences it will have on the on the on the um, attitude of people towards globalization, because I think that we there we will see some change but interesting it is so that you know the the the, the notion of america first has in actually increased um, america's support for international trade at least when it comes to the public okay and this is something um i like because i do i'll deal with, I deal with transatlantic security alliance uh, is that especially also among americans that nato um has more support nowadays um within the American public than it did under Obama, for example. So um, you can also say that his skepticism of multilateralism, his skepticism of alliances um, has also led to increase in support 
of these institutions and something we can debate later on that actually United States has contributed more um, to NATO under Donald Trump than it did under the Obama administration. So I think this is something we should not forget. And this is something also why Democrats might feel um, old enough to actually, you know, put the, the theme of alliances and partnerships um, in international affairs also high on their agenda when it comes to foreign policy issues. And there we see um, actually, um, especially among, among Democrats, um, I've, I've tried to mark it with a, with, a blue, uh, with a blue sign that improving alliances and improving relationship with allies um, is the most important foreign policy goal, the most important um, priority for Democrats, while it's not so much for, um, for, for the Republican Party. So you can see that when it comes to foreign policy, of course, we have, again, partisan divides. Um, when it comes to climate change, for example, or when it comes to, um, to as I said, you know, dealing with, dealing with um, um, partnerships and so on. But in general, you can see that, um, especially the, 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 the theme of improving alliances ranks very high among Democrats in this regard. Um, this is also um, just another slide to, to illustrate um, partisan divides between um, the Republicans and the Democrats. And you can really see that ever since uh, Donald Trump took office, you can see it, where is it? Uh, you can see it in the, in, the, in the right column that, or in the right graph, that actually, you know, Democrats have been somehow energized in their support for alliances and partnership, and that the theme of international relations actually ranks nowadays higher on the democratic agenda than it did um, before Donald Trump was elected. So uh, basically, you can say that the America first policy approach by Donald Trump energized the Democrats in terms of foreign policy, in terms of what they want, but also in terms of um, how to best approach um, Donald Trump in the presidential election campaign. Um, as I said in the beginning of my presentation, um, everything we're now talking when it comes to a presidential race is highly speculative. So we really don't know, you know how things might turn out. Um, as I'd indicated before, um, before the coronavirus um, spread within the United States, the economy was in a very good state. It, it, it's debatable whether it's just you know Donald Trump and his policies, or if it was you know was comfortable enough to um, to um, benefit from the Obama administration. This is not really um, the priority, or this is not really an important thing. Um, but um, before COVID-19 took place, um, the economy was in a very good shape. That's why um, the Trump administration could also think about you know what kind of themes would we like to. Um, would we like to um, put on the high agenda in the presidential race? Um, the thing is now um, with the economy or with the trust or the assessment of the public opinion of the economy going you know, really downhill, um, you know, I think or I fear that, um, you know, foreign policy will not rank that high, um, of course, on, um, on, the, on the agenda of both parties. Um, that you know the, the 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 discussion about how can we, who's to blame, and how can we you know get out of this recession and out of this crisis will take the main stage during the presidential campaigns. Um, and see also um, you know another indicate which you know shows how you know the um, the economy is actually suffering with a um, high percentage of of. Um, unemployment currently in the United States. So you had, you know, a record low of merely about 3.7% of unemployment rate. And within the one month, you had um, more than 14% of unemployment rate. So of course, in this regard, foreign policy does not really matter when it comes um, to the presidential election. Well, not really. And I think one thing that will be also uh, very important for the coming presidential elections is actually, you know, how how do Americans evaluate crisis management of, of the Trump administration? 
Um, so you can see that you know the approvement or the approval or disapproval um, of the crisis management by the White House has varied over time. But ever since um, you know um, the death toll rose, um, you could say you can see that more and more people became um, this or disapproved of the crisis management. And this is also why you currently can see when you look at the Biden campaign, this is something that the Biden campaign, of course, wants to exploit um, by, you know, putting emphasis on the poor crisis management by the Trump administration and also by um, presenting Biden himself as somebody who would work with the scientists and who would be a far better, you know, leader in crisis than the Trump administration has been. But once again, what does that mean for foreign policy? Um, actually, I read a very interesting article which also focuses or which predicts that although the, the economy and domestic issues will dominate, of course, now after you know the pandemic um, eases off somehow, um, that they that this will actually um, dominate the presidential campaign. There is one common factor that might actually decide um, the election, and this is. China. Um, I know that you had previous um, a previous lecture on American Chinese um, relations, so I don't want to go so much into that. It's just very interesting to see that currently um, China, whether it's in terms of you know shifting the blame from the United States or from the crisis management within the White House um, to China, so the, the scapegoating escape goating argument, you could say, really um, ranks high when you think of international relations. And I hope it works, um, but I have two contrasting um, presidential ads, uh, two brief ads I would like to show to you. And I hope this works because it illustrates quite well how both the Biden campaign and the Trump um, administration and the Trump campaign deal with the, with the issue of China um, as a foreign policy topic in um, in the in the presidential elections and just let me I hope it works let me see if that actually um, and I just need a sh um, 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 mm -hmm. um, okay I, I'll try to make it work um, but I've just I would need one sign actually if it's um, one note if you can actually see it. So far, we are still seeing your presentation. Okay, thank you. That was what I was wondering. Okay, so, okay, one more minute. So, and now you can see um, YouTube? Yes. Yes, we can. <laughs> yes, we can. Okay. Um, this is a crisis. Okay. This is no time for Donald Trump's record of hysterical xenophobia. By this son inked a billion dollar deal with a subsidiary of the Bank of China. China is going to you know what? Come on. They're not bad folks, folks. Since the outbreak, the Communist Party has been mobilizing overseas organizations to buy local supplies and send them to China. It was in our self-interest that China continued to prosper. What a beautiful history we wrote together. Banning all travel will not stop. The president is right. The travel restriction on China, as every public health official we've talked to said, bought the country time. That was a very smart move right there. Xenophobia. Xenophobia. I complimented him on, uh, on dealing with China. I'm not going nuts. So what you actually came here, okay. Uh, da, 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 da. I'll play him. Okay, um, so what you actually um, could see in this campaign ad by, um, by Donald Trump is that the focus is no longer on make America great again or keep America great. It was not mentioned one single time. And when you look back on the campaign so far, you know, the Trump campaign uh, with, the, with the economy actually going downhill actually changed to, uh, you know, putting focus on China. So, and also putting uh, emphasis on who's tougher on China, whether it's, you know, 
Joe Biden or Donald Trump. So the role of China is increasingly important in this um, presidential campaign. And to, to, let me just show you another one. And this is another um, campaign ad by the Biden campaign. So you see the contrast between these two because also the Biden campaign actually picks up um, China as a as an important um, issue in this presidential campaign. So. He failed to act. So now Trump and his allies are launching negative attacks against Joe Biden to hide the truth. Here are the facts. Joe Biden warned the nation in January that Trump had left us unprepared for a pandemic. Then Biden told Trump he should insist on having American health experts on the ground in China. I would be on the phone with China and making it clear. We are going to need to be in your country. You have to be open. You have to be clear. We have to know what's going on. But Trump rolled over for the Chinese. He took their word for it. The president tweeted, China has been working very hard to contain the coronavirus. The United States greatly appreciates their efforts and transparency. China has spoken with President Xi, and they're working very, very hard. And I think it's going to all work out fine. Trump praised the Chinese 15 times in January and February as the coronavirus spread across the world. It's a tough situation. I think they're doing a very good job. I think that China will do a very good job. Trump never got a CDC team on the ground in China. And the travel ban he brags about, Trump let in 40,000 travelers from China into America after he signed it. Not exactly airtight. Look around. 22 million Americans are out of work, and we have more officially reported cases and deaths than any other country. Donald Trump left this country unprepared and unprotected for the worst public health and economic crisis in our lifetime. We are paying the price. All the negative ads in the world can't change the truth. Okay. He failed to yeah. act. So okay. now Trump and his Once is enough. Um, okay, let me return to um, my presentation. Um, so I hope what you could see during um, during the, these uh, during this ad by the Biden campaign is that they also picked up the topic of China and who is softer on China and who you know was tougher on China and who you know, is actually to blame for the crisis. So uh, I think what you really can see uh, in the in the months to come is, you know, um, the development of the narrative, okay, who is tougher on China and who will be tougher on China, not just in terms of the COVID-19 crisis, but also in general, uh, when it comes to the rise of China. Um, I think this is also uh, supported by the fact when you look at polls currently conducted by the United uh, by um, by Pew Research, for example, when um, people are asked to evaluate to assess how they see um, China, that you can actually see um, that China, um, you know, is actually uh, you know more and more seen in a negative manner in the United States, and not just. Um, you know, due to the COVID-19 crisis, but also before, but there's actually a consensus among the American public uh, that, you know, China poses a severe challenge, not just in, in terms of trade, in terms of, of systems, but also in terms of security and defense policy. And, you know, you have this broad consensus among the American public that China poses a challenge. So this is something that both campaigns are very likely to pick up and consider in their further presidential campaign. And as you can see in this slide, for example, is that although there are some differences between the GOP and the Democrats, um, you can still see that it's a bipartisan um, concern um, among the Americans, uh, that both the Republicans and Democrats see China as a, as a problem, as a challenge, as you could say. Um, so my last slide, and then I'm really looking forward um, to the debate is, uh, so what can we actually expect, you know, in terms of foreign policy in the presidential debate? Of course, um, it is, you know, as I said, the presidential race will be really dependent on the efficiency of the lockdown measures. Um, it will be uh, dependent on how successful the United States and how successful Donald Trump will be able to reopen the economy. Um, I mean, he's really keen on reopening the, reopening the economy because he knows, you know, a strong economy is always a good, you know, a, a good 
thing to have in a presidential race. Um, we will have continued scapegoating, um, not just you know within within the United States. So because the Trump administration, you know, likes to blame uh, you know Joe Biden and the the Obama administration when it comes to you know, setting the conditions for such a pandemic in the United States, but also um, externally, you can see that actually, you know, you have an international, um, an international um, fight, you know, for, 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 or fight of, or a competition of narratives between United States and, and China. So who's to blame for the COVID-19 crisis? I think this is something which will um, harden and continue through um, till November, certainly. And um, I don't know, probably uh, sometimes, you know, when, when you want to deflect attention or when you want to deflect from domestic problems, it could be, you know, uh, that sometimes presidents tend to, or tend to, um, you know, tend to have a, um, how should we say that, how should we pose it, um, you know, you know, want to put the focus more on foreign policy issues, especially when it comes to the Trump administration, you could expect, you know, real tougher lines um, or harder lines vis-a-vis -vis, uh, both allies and competitors in terms of foreign policy. So, you know, that the Trump administration wants to underline that it's actually taking a hard line, that it's actually tougher on certain uh, foreign policy issues, whether it's Iran, whether it's NATO, whether it's China. So I think this is, these are, three things that we really can look forward to. And now I'm very happy to discuss with all of you um, the, the, the role of foreign policy uh, and in general, any foreign policy related question you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation, Ms. Walter. I think it became really clear um, how in your presentation, not only the role of foreign policy as a campaign issue and that um, most foreign policy issues are not really high on the priority list of many voters except for national security threats terrorism or if we have extended wars which then play a role but what's also really interesting is the different narratives of the republicans and democrats and here in particular that independently how you evaluate trump's foreign policies that he kept a lot of his and fulfilled a lot of his campaign promises. However, that the voters not necessarily approve these policies. And we see it in Greece in, in, in public opinion on support for, for NATO or for free trade. Mm -hmm. However, with regard to China, it seems like this negative image or this yeah, image of yeah, more or less an enemy seems to um, attach more and more or be attractive for more and more uh, US voters and we see also that Democrats have to shift more or less to some extent to this narrative of the Trump that, that China is a bad guy and, and has to be addressed uh, with, with a tough stance and there you can maybe differ on foreign policy but more or less to some extent Democrats have to shift that way uh, to attract voters in particular maybe in battleground states where there is more a critical view on free trade or uh, NATO and so on. So um, I think uh, before I ask questions, if I even ask a question, we will see how many, um, many um, from the audience want to ask a question. We will begin now with the Q&A uh, Q session. Uh, you can engage by clicking on the blue hand that Zoom provides in its menu. And therefore, you have to click first on the button Participants or Teilnehmer. Mm -hmm. And uh, our student assistant, Ms. Herbst, will help to manage the sequence of the questions. Um, Ms. Herbst, many thanks for your help. Always a pleasure. Um, I also have got two questions already. Um, one was posed by Mr. Nienabo, and this was uh, Mrs. Rotter. You mentioned a podcast right at the beginning. Um, could you tell us the name again? Um, it's called uh, it's um, um, by political 
um, the magazine and it's called the political playbook. And actually this is something that everybody in Washington listens to. So even President Obama supposedly was uh, listened to it. So it's just five minutes long. You get a newsletter every day and I just really can recommend it. So it's called playbook by Politico. Okay, thank you very much. That really sounds interesting. Um, a second question that came up uh, referred to what you were talking about with the videos. It was posed by uh, Mr. Adolf. Um, do you think Donald Trump's time in office has done lasting damage to America's international standing? Or do you believe allies and partners will see it as a short aberration? Would you also expect a Biden administration to take a similarly tough stance on China? Mm -hmm. um, so two things. So when you look at polls, I mean, probably most of you have seen the polls of international, you know, of the international standing, the international reputation um, of the United States that, you know, in terms of reliability or also in terms of do we trust the American government, the American, um, yeah, the American, you know, the United States to actually, you know, um, conduct a good foreign policy. And you can see that when it comes to the Trump administration, uh, it's down to a historic low. So you have the Obama administration and it's down to a historic low. Um, but the thing is, um, so when it comes to international reputation and the trust, it's always very, very flexible. So it's very fluent. So you had, you know, a very bad reputation or bad image of the United States in terms of international relations during the Bush campaign, then came the Trump, and then came the Obama administration, and it went high up, and then came the Trump administration. So in terms of reliability, I think, um, you know, this is always dependent on, on who's on who is sitting in the White House. But I think some of the changes that Donald Trump took, so I think, okay, so I think we can restore the trust under a new administration. I think this is something which will take some time, but I think you know to restore trust in the United States as a reliable partner is possible. But I think um, it's not very likely that the Democrats will you know change the foreign policy um, because, for example, um, as you mentioned um, with regard to China, um, there's a bipartisan um, there's a bipartisan um, consensus. There's also a bipartisan consensus that, um, you know, the United States has to reconsider its international, um, its international involvement, you know, that, you know, a huge standing army or huge numbers of troops in foreign countries, for example, in, in Europe, like we have via the NATO presence, um, that's not something the United States is longer interested in. So, um, basically, you could say that, um, so, so the threat perception or the perception of how the international world is going, you know, to look like how the international order is going to look like, um, is pretty similar among GOP and uh, among the Democrats. So they both see that, you know, that the, the, the future of the international order or the future um, of global politics uh, will be in the Pacific for the United States. So that's where also Democrats will point, you know, their focus in the, in the years to come. Um, and it's, I think it's also, you know, it's, it's wrong to assume that if Hillary Clinton had been elected to the White House, uh, that, you know, the debate about burden sharing within NATO, uh, that, you know, the shift or the pivot towards Asia, that this wouldn't have come. So I think Donald Trump, um, in his an or the, uh, the analysis of the Trump administration that, you know, um, the geo or the great power competition with China will take more and more effort or will take more and more um, concentration within American foreign policy. I think this is something that both the, the Republicans and the Democrats will share or do share. But of course, when it comes to what kind of conclusion do you draw out of this, you know, change in international affairs, um, you can say that you can sure be sure that the Democrats will would take another approach or different approach uh, than the Trump administration, as you could have, as you could see, you know, on their on their emphasis on restoring partnerships. So I think um, just because the Democrats would win the White House, for example, I don't think that you know European countries. Um, can take a break in their efforts to strengthen their own security policy or their own defense policy because the focus in the long term, the strategic focus of, in the long term of the United States will be in the 
um, Asian Pacific region and no longer in the Middle East and not necessarily in Europe. And this is, you know, regardless of whether there's a Republican in the White House or a Democrat. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I see here one student or visitor of the lecture would like to uh, pose a question him or herself. Um, I'll unmute you and you can ask your question. I'm talking about Mr. or Mrs. Oizaki. Hello. Um, I have unmuted you if you'd like to pose your question. Are you hearing me? Yes, we are. Okay, very good. Um, so I'm going to divert um, attention away from political issues um, that are discussed mostly on, uh, on media, like Iran and et cetera, and go rather to the broader lines that govern um, world economic relations. So um, from the 1970s, I would say the world has been drifting into what's called a, a, a trip, um, tripolarism, um, tri tripolarism or uh, trilateralism in world economics and world politics. And this means that these are, there are three major blocks that, uh, economic and political blocks that compete with each other. The first is the Asian Pacific, uh, most notably with, with China as its core and other Asian uh, regionally integrated economies as, as its periphery like uh, Singapore and uh, other, yeah. The second competitive block is uh, Europe and it's headed by Germany who uh, made a huge step forward in the uh, unification of the European mm -hmm. common market and so on, and um, had uh, Eastern Europe as an economic periphery. And uh, the third block is the Anglophone sphere, uh, where US represents the main core and uh, incorporates Latin America, Mexico, and Canada as a semi-periphery and periphery. Um, now, my point is, or my question is, with regard to Africa uh, as virgin territory for investments, and, uh, and relating to the competition between these uh, three economic blocks uh, I was mentioning a few seconds ago, should we expect a trade war or trade rivalry on Africa between the United States and China? And I think it's also worth noting here that um, um, I'm reading a book uh, entitled um, um, La Chine dans le monde, and, um, and uh, it says that China represents 15% of uh, total foreign investments mm. in contrast to 2% for Brazil, 4%, 4% for Germany, and 7% for the United States. So you see there is huge different, uh, difference between uh, the, three, uh, the three cores. Um, so yes, and um, if we are to expect um, after, I mean, if we are to expect a, a rivalry in on, on Africa, what would be the strategies that uh, the United States would follow? Uh, thank you very much. Okay, very good points, very interesting question. Uh, okay, I try to answer it, uh, but I'm not an expert on Africa, so this is something I can, okay, I, I, um, I try to. Um, so you're absolutely right, uh, when you think of um, of Chinese investment and also Chinese engagement in, in Africa, um, that they have done a really good job when it comes to Africa. So in terms of foreign direct investment, in terms of creating jobs, um, in terms of, you know, also like um, cultural diplomacy, you know, in, in, in promoting, you know, Chinese culture to a certain extent. And in the beginning, um, you know, um, the, the, the many African countries actually welcomed this, this kind of engagement and this kind of investment from China. Um, because um, compared, for example, to, to the European Union or to European countries, um, China did not have that, you know, that negative image or that heavy heritage of colonialism. So this is something that um, gave China some kind of advantage vis-a-vis -vis European countries, for example. And when you look to, for example, to German, um, to German economic aid, um, no, when we give economic aid, for example, to um, to, um, to African countries, we try to uh, make them based or try to, you know, condition them on certain criteria that they have to meet, for example, in terms of human rights standards. And when China actually entered, you know, the African market in terms of, you know, foreign direct investment, um, China did not um, really 
um, put the same conditions in, in place, you know, so they were not so much based on human rights conditions to be met, for example. So that's why China um, had a huge advantage vis-a-vis -vis European countries, for example. But, and you have to admit, um, and that's something I think you also mentioned, um, that for a long time, um, Africa was not really um, considered um, considered important for the United States, for example, in terms of, you know, um, foreign direct investment giving economic aid or so. Um, so the thing that we currently see in Africa is that China has a huge advantage when it comes to, um, to foreign direct investment, when it comes to, um, you know, relations with certain countries, when it comes to so-called strategic resources, for example, because as you mentioned, um, Africa is really, you know, rich when it comes to um, resources that, you know, uh, digitalization, for example, needs. Um, so um, China is, you know, on the edge there. So they're really at advantage there. And also when it comes to, um, for example, um, how do you say, you know, like military bases. So China just um, a couple of years ago installed a military um, base in Djibouti, for example. So uh, China is increasingly also, you know, seeing Africa as a strategic um, uh, or, or under strategic considerations. Um, for a long time, the problem was that for the United States and for uh, for Europe, um, Africa was only regarded under the under or through the lenses of terrorism, for example. So when we think about, you know, like Mali, for example, or uh, when you think of Libya or Syria, uh, you can see that the, 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 the concentration nowadays of European and American engagement in Africa is, is based on terrorism and how can we prevent, you know, terrorism to spread um, to, to Europe, for example. And uh, one thing that the Trump administration also made very clear was that, you know, especially in Northern Africa, for example, this is something that the United States considers America, uh, Europe's backyard. So this is not something that the United States should take care of, but this is something that the European Union should actually take care of because it's in their hemispheres, in, in their direct um, neighborhood. So that's why um, also due to the fact that the United States, for example, they didn't want you know, another military entanglement. So that's why they want to shift the responsibility also on the continent of Africa um, to Europe. But one thing that is currently changing um, is um, the perception among African countries when it comes to Chinese investment um, is because, you know, um, China, um, you know, also what you can see on, on in Eastern Europe, for example, is that, you know, just because Chinese investment flows in that, you know, jobs are not really created, but uh, that many countries who actually took this kind of foreign investment, that they are now heavily indebted. And that, uh, you know, the lack of concern for human rights um, or for, you know, for, for workers' rights, for example, also takes its toll on the perception of China within um, the African countries. I hope this kind of, uh, I hope this kind of answers your question. But as you can see, you know, when you look at economic aid come stemming from the United States, current, uh, certainly the Trump administration, they did not, you know, really focus on it because they cut, you know, USAID, they cut, you know, the State Department um, financial measures um, to, for example, Africa. Um, so right now, I think the United States, but also Europe, underestimated the importance of Africa. And this is something that we certainly will have to think of more although I believe that China has a, a great advantage already when it comes to the African continent. All right, um, there have been further questions posted in the chat. The first one was from Mr. Bock, and he first of all thanks you for the lecture, and then asks, can you elaborate on what characterizes the 2021 Democrats foreign policy vision? On what topics and issues does it differ from the restorationist vision? Mm -hmm. um, so what I found very interesting when it comes to the 2021 Democrats is um, I can sure share the link also by um, 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 by Thomas Wright or to the article by Thomas Wright. So um, what he makes out is it's not, um, you know, 2021 Democrats, it's not, you know, like a coherent group, a cohesive group, so, or it's not very homogeneous, um, homogeneous um, but actually, you know, you have different 
um, you have you know different um, emphasis put on on different topics. So what they have in common actually is the the assumption that going back or just you know going back to the pre uh, Trump um, foreign policy won't will not um, suffice anymore because they see or they agree with Trump or with the Trump administration in this regard. Um, that the world has considerably changed. That um, you know the international order um, is not so much is threatened, for example, not just by China but by authoritarianism in general, and that is something uh, that um, the United States has to deal with. Um, some argue that, for example, um, and this might be interesting for us in Europe, that you know the the the, the the emphasis, for example, of the two percent goal of the GDP, or to 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 spread, to uh, to spend two percent of the GDP on defense spending, for example, um, should not take such a such an important role, but rather look at the um, um, at the practical impact or the practical contributions each country can have. Um, in general, they um, they um, they how to say that um, they in general, you know, they they think that they don't call the international order in question, um, but they are the first ones to admit that actually, you know, the international order is despite, you know, American leadership in, in a very bad shape and that you might, you know, have to look for, you know, other, you could say alliances or you could say for other um, orders um, that might replace it. Um, so you, you don't have this coherent, you know, this coherent, how do you say, um, group of people, but just um, so the basic notion or the common ground for all these people is that, um, you know, the, going back to the status quo is not possible. It's also, but I'm not a trade expert, it also comes to, you know, that they have more, um, that they, they are not really supportive in terms of trade war, but that they see that, um, for example, tariffs might be or might not be a very good thing. Um, so um, you have different, you know, they draw different conclusions, if I can make it, you know, any more understandable. So you have different strains, different, different strains coming into this, which might, you know, exceed um, what Biden tries, you know, to do with his foreign policy vision of restore or going back to the Obama, uh, to the Obama years. So, um, you know, this, the, the, the assessment of the situation is different. And what also right, um, 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 Holtz puts down in his in his in his article, and I, I'm I'm really um, I, I'm happy to share it. Is that you know they are called the 2021 Democrats and not the 2020 Democrats because um, the way he sees it is that you know you have this new vision you know in the uh, you know at the beginning uh, of forming. So it's not a it's not already a formed vision. But actually, it's something you know that is currently taking place, and this is why it's so interesting to see how the different strains um, fit into that in the in the end. And I think um, you know, whenever you know, depending on whether you know the Biden campaign actually succeeds in, in gaining the White House, and I think you will see it in certain um, administration positions, you know, where you have people actually that you know go even further than just going back to the status quo. But I'm very happy to share the link with perhaps I can I will do it afterwards, but I'm very happy to share the link um, to the to the article. Yeah, that would be very nice. Um, if you want, you can post it in the chat later on or something. OK, um, there is one further question by Mr. Antiveros, and he asks, what would you say about how the level of knowledge of American voters about foreign policy topics affects their opinions and actions compared to their knowledge and stakes in more domestic state and even local issues. Do you believe the image which politicians paint of themselves sometimes ends up being more relevant for election results, as we saw in the videos, than any actual consequences of foreign policy, which arguably only a small fraction of the voting population might have a sort of grasp on? Grasp on? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, I think it's, I think, actually, I'm not quite sure whether, you, you know, in this kind, you know, when you think about uh, what do people actually know about foreign policy, if it's so much different from what they know in domestic politics. Um, so, 
Um, it's just a little excurs. So I did a project on um, strategic communication in Germany. And, um, you know, in general, people assume that, you know, people are less informed about foreign policy than they are in, in domestic affairs, for example. Um, but the study we did actually found out that, you know, um, people are not less informed when it comes to foreign policy, uh, but they are, you know, just as bad informed or just as badly informed when it comes to foreign policy as they were during domestic issues. Um, so, um, of course, you know, and the first thing, I think it's, it's always interesting, you know, when you, I know that American have the, Americans have the reputation of not show, uh, have the reputation, you know, of not really uh, looking what's beyond their coastlines because, you know, they don't know, um, you know, they don't know the capital of Germany or they don't know that, I don't know, Romania is a country or that Africa is a continent and not a country. Um, I don't think this is this really influences the decision in the end. Um, but I think the problem we see nowadays in the United States is that um, also due to the media, for example, that you have, uh, depending on whether you view uh, Fox News, for example, or whether you, um, you know, read the New York Times or whether you, um, you know, watch your news on, on um, what's the other one, CNBC, for example, um, that you get portrayed, you know, that you have, you know, that you actually live in different worlds. And this is also part of the foreign policy um, thing. So, you know, on Fox News, you know, every decision taken by Trump is somehow defended that, you know, a tough line of the United States vis-a-vis -vis Iran, for example, is a good thing that the JCPOA, the, the Iran deal, for example, is a, is a, um, you know, the, the tough line of getting out of the GCPOA is actually a very good thing to do. While you know, when you when you look to the more liberal media, you know, um, other things get highlighted and pointed out that, for example, the Trump administration lacks and lacks real a real strategy when dealing with Iran. So I think uh, for the for the electorate, it's really important to know you know what kind of news do they consume. Um, so you know, people living within America. Um, you know, they have different conceptions, different, uh, different understandings of foreign policies, of what's important, of what's not important. Some things get left out completely on Fox News, while others, you know, uh, while other news rank very low in, in liberal media. So I think, um, I think it's, it's also important, you know, how you frame things. Uh, but I wouldn't say that, you know, for this election, it will be really important uh, that people, you know, what people actually know about it because, you know, they're being fed what actually, you know, the media and, and the spins, as you can see. So somebody watching and the Trump ad will very likely not watch the Biden app. So you only get one vision of the coin. So you get only one side of the coin, you only one interpretation. And um, I think when you look also, or when you look to Trump alleys, when you think about, um, about the role of you know portraying yourself as a tough leader as a charismatic leader um, i think this is something that really appealed to many uh, when you, they think of donald trump also in terms of foreign policy so i i still don't understand it really <laughs> uh, from that point of view because you know um, these there are so many things wrong with how foreign policy um, is conducted by, by the Trump administration. But I think when you um, consider the 2020 election, um, China will certainly, and this might be int actually interesting because we have this consensus, you know, that China is a challenge um, when you think of foreign policy. Uh, so this will be really interesting, but I don't know if they're really less informed or just less in interested because I know from the German experience that, you know, <laughs> People in Germany just are just as badly informed about the most domestic politics as they are about um, foreign policy. So I don't know if that really then you know matters in the presidential election. Okay, uh, very nice. Thank you for the answer. Um, while you were speaking, there came another question, um, which is not only related to foreign policy, but to this issue of being informed. Um, and experiencing things in a different manner. 
Um, it says, how do you view the impact of whether state government succeeds or fails in handling the COVID crisis on the election, especially in regard to the differently governed states, Democrats versus Republicans? For example, might people in failing Republican states become disillusioned with the Trump government? Um, I mean, in the, in the early beginning, you could see that you had um, different approaches between um, states or governors which belong to the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, but you also had strong, um, um, you had some um, Republican governors of, of, um, of, um, of states which were heavily in, um, affected by, by, um, by the, by the COVID-19 by the COVID-19 virus that um, actually took harder measures, you know, that really, you know, criticized Donald Trump that, um, um, you know, went more along the lines of the Democrats than they did with the Trump administration. Um, I think when you look at the situation right now is that, um, you know, but I might be wrong on this, is um, that, um, you know, especially Republican governed states are more keen or are more keen to reopen the economy and to, you know, um, to do away or to ease the lockdown measures than the Democrat states are. Um, could also be the case because when you look at the, at the epicenters of, of um, the COVID-19 crisis, where, where, the, where you, know, you had many infected people, where you had a high death toll, uh, you know, it was mostly along the coastal lines. It was in the, in the for example, in the North, um, um, Michigan, and Detroit, and Chicago, uh, but also in Louisiana, but most of the heavily infected states in the beginning were actually um, democratic states, and that's also why they, you know, took such a contrary position um, when it came to the Trump administration. But I think, um, but this is just my general assumption right now, is that when you look at the at the states who support, um, you know, easing the lockdown measures in the states of um, and and the ones who, you know, to who want to reopen the economy sooner than later, um, is that you know you have now more Republican governed states who would you know cite the Trump administration in in making sure um, that you know we put we try to reopen the economy um, despite the possible you know um, the possible you know challenges that arise from that um, that for example infections might increase again. I mean, one very, um, I think it was the deputy governor of, of Texas who actually stated that, you know, um, I would, or older people would gladly die um, just, you know, to, to make sure that my grandparents have a good economy they can take over. Um, so I would say right now you have, you know, Republicans, at least these ones who are not as heavily in fa as heavily impacted by the coronavirus as, for example, New York or California or uh, or Louisiana, for example, that they are more keen on reopening and lining or or you know and aligning um, their policies with the Trump administration than they um, than the Democratic states, I would say. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so far, I don't see any further questions coming up. Then I would jump in and ask a question. And um, I just want to mention uh, some studies back in the days in the 50s. Um, Gabriel Almond or Peter Rosencrantz, they wrote about, okay, uh, the first time on about the importance or relevance of international um, affairs and foreign policy for the American electorate. And they found that it's not really important as nowadays, but that there are different forms of public. So the mass public where foreign affairs usually doesn't play a role. And there's something called the attentive public. So it is usually around 15% more or less, um, which follows politics daily, which are not involved in decision making, but as I said, follow um, politics daily. And they are much more informed and also interested in, in foreign policy. And my question would be, do you think that the attentive public is of a special relevance or importance for elections? Or did this maybe change 
because of populism, so increasing populism, or because of the public discourse change due to digitalization, it became more diverse. Yeah, that would be my question. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, it, it's very interesting. Um, I've read when it comes to um, when it comes, for example, to foreign policy, uh, that um, there are several studies that you know you don't even have a, a attentive public, which is important for po foreign policy decisions and the discourse. Um, so um, one study actually says I I don't know the name. I'm so bad with names, but. Um, I just remember that, you know, one study actually says that when it comes to foreign policy and the American public or public in general, that foreign policy is actually driven by elites or thought to be driven or is not driven by, it is driven by elites and by the media, but not, you know, in a, in a, in a not in a bad way, but just, you know, the, 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 the assumption is that when it comes to foreign policy to issues that um, are not direct, directly, you know, um, in connection or that don't relate to everybody's daily life, you know, um, like for example, health care does, uh, that people are willing to actually, you know, take on the position of the elite or of the media. So in the media elite um, public, you could say. So at least when it comes to foreign policy, um, how has the public changed? Um, I think it has changed. Um, I think problem the problem of the digitalization is that nowadays, you know, you can have you can get your news from everywhere. So you're you know everybody can be a journalist, and this is something you see with the spread of misinformation and disinformation um, in the Corona crisis. Um, that also why states actually have you know like disinformation campaigns directed at European countries, at the United States, um, because they try to exploit this so that, you know, our, the way we, so we have way more, you know, opportunity to participate in the public discourse, but also have way more challenges posed by it. So you have on the one side, uh, you could also say that, you know, our fears, our public got more and more fragmented. Uh, so this fragmentation certainly led to to problems, you know, that people within, you know, certain groups, they don't get all the news. So when you, you I'm not an expert on, on Facebook or anything, but you know, when you, when you go on your news sites, or when you go to Facebook, or when you go to Google, you know, um, you don't, really decide what kind of news you get based on algorithms and based on you know this targeted um you know the targeted piece of information you get based on your former sources or former research um res or, or research inquiries on google for example so i think this kind of fragmentation has really led you know to the, to the problem that we have different Public or with different fields of public that don't really interact with each other. And of course, you know, so you have your two different bubbles also when it comes to foreign policy that, you know, you have, um, you have like people, um, you know, adhering to, to the Trump administration and uh, you have people adhering to a democratic bubble. So when you go to Facebook, I know I live in a bubble. That's why I'm always trying to, to look at what's going on on Fox News, for example, although it's really terrible, I have to admit. Um, but I think, yeah, the, the digitalization is something that um, really changed not just how information is, is spread, but also how information is interpreted and and how you know opinions are formed based on this information due to the digitalization and this is something um we're still not coming you know we're still not really aware of and also when it comes to you know forming policies is, is it media literacy is it you know talking to google or facebook that they should you know have a better look on what's um going on in the social media channels um, so we're still, you know, at the very beginning of understanding what this kind of digitalization and how, you know, how these new technologies really have impacted on how we get information and what we make out of this information. Um, I don't know if this answers your questions. Perfectly. <laughs> Thank you. 
And I think we come to an end. Uh, Ms. Herbst, is there one more question or? Yeah, exactly. There would be, um, yeah, actually two more questions that came in here. If we um, do we have time for both or just one? No, sure. Go ahead. I like it. I like it. <laughs> okay, I'm glad. Um, the first question was asked by Mr. Prisman. What would your best expectations for German-American relations be? Just as a short statement. Okay, um, my best expectation would be that Germany, um, you know, takes on more international responsibility, also in terms of, you know, military spending, in terms of assuming, um, you know, responsibility when it comes to its security and defense policy. And um, for the American side, it would be that we, again, you know, focus more on alliances and partnerships that, you know, the administration is, um, you know, aware of that, you know, also in the context of the great power competition that um, between the United States and, and China, uh, that, you know, the United States has the advantage of, or, you know, to date had the advantage of strong alliances, which China did not have. Um, so I think, you know, to put emphasis more um, on the alliance, on the partnership aspect, uh, while also, you know, from a European point of view, um, you know, we should understand that the strategic um, priorities of the Americans have changed, and that's why we in Germany also have to take on more responsibility. So um, I don't want to call it free riding, but to a certain extent, Germany in particular has done lots of free riding, um, you know, on to the debt, not to the detriment, but, you know, we gladly accept that America's security alliances and everything. So I would love to have a more balanced you know, relationship between the United States and Germany, at least in, when it comes to security and defense policy. Very nice. Do you think a new ambassador would change anything about that? Um, it's, gonna, it's, it's going to be interesting. I mean, Grinnell, he was certainly, um, you know, not of the diplomatic kind. Um, or he was not, he was not a real diplomat. He, he was, you know, a, a, a Trump supporter and he was somebody, you know, um, among, from the Trump, you know, in a circle, I would say, who, you know, who didn't question Donald Trump, but, you know, who actually was appointed because he shared the views and was willing to, you know, put pressure on Germany. Um, I don't know if we will have, I mean, when you look at all the other positions, you know, because in the Trump administration, you had so many positions that had to be, you know, refilled because people, you know, kept going and leaving the administration. Uh, I just fear that, you know, you won't find somebody um, who's... So, the way I see it, Donald Trump, you know, keeps surrounding himself more and more with hardliners who share his vision of foreign policy, you could you, you saw that in different positions. So I think, you know, if we get a new ambassador before the 2020 elections, when we actually have the hearing to, 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 um, to get the nomination and to, to, to have the appointment of a new ambassador, I don't think that he will be any less Grinnell-like than we hope he might be. Um, so I don't think that we should, you know, expect a, a great relaxation of relations based on the ambassador in Germany. All right, thank you very much. And the following would really be the last question, I guess, um, about the future development of alliances in the Pacific. So the US mm -hmm. and Malaysia, the Philippines, and also uh, the US will to act on them, e.g. Um, advance on China or on Taiwan. Mm -hmm. um, could you repeat the last part of the question? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, advances of China on Taiwan would be something that interests Ms. Franken. Okay, um, so when you think of alliances in, in the Pacific, um, I mean, for, there are certain parallel, parallel, parallels, uh, you know, certain similarities to the, the approach of the Trump administration to NATO, but also to the Pacific partners, uh, that, you know, the Pacific partners um, should do more um, to increase, for example, military spending or to, you know, you know, in Trump terms, to actually pay for troop presence more, uh, for example, in South Korea. Uh, but one interesting fact is that Donald Trump seemed to be more, way more critical, for example, of European countries, way more critical um, of, of Germany than, 
than he was with Japan, I think. And one of the um, things that we are going to say and uh, see, and this is also illustrated in the uh, in a recent report by the done by the Pentagon on um, on the Asian Pacific, is we will see way more um, engagement in the Asian Pacific, but also with partnerships. So this is something that stood out um, that you can see for the Asian Pacific or for the Indo-Pacific. It was a report on the Indo-Pacific, so that's what they call it. Um, that partnership really make a great deal of the strategy um, um, of the United States in in um, in the in the region. So I think we're going to see uh, increased efforts um, actually to to try, you know, trying to re revive, uh, you know, to trying to revive the, the the alliances and also to keep them at bay. And I think also, you know, when you look at the threat perceptions in the Indo-Pacific, you know, um, the threat perceptions in the Indo-Pacific um, countries have vis-a-vis -vis China certainly more critical than, for example, here in in in, in Europe vis-a-vis -vis Russia. So of course you have the Baltics and you have Poland and everything, you know, who are really neighbors of of Russia, Russia and because of you know um, the history, are where are more skeptical and more. Uh, fearful of Russia intervention than other countries in in Europe, uh, but when you look at the um, when you look at the um, when you look at the uh, Indo-Pacific, um, certainly the threat perception is higher. But one thing, for example, when you look at TT. Um, P the Transatlantic uh, Trans TPP the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, was that you know China's economic cloud in this region is also growing. So this is some um, something why um, um, you know why it's going to be interesting. Why the United States will have to put more, more effort into the region into the alliances uh, in the in, with countries like South Korea, like Japan, because, you know, the economic cloud of China and the economic um, attraction, you know, um, is way more important uh, to some countries um, than it is the situation in Europe. When you think of Taiwan, um, I think nowadays we have to look towards Hong Kong, actually. So what's going to happen with Hong Kong and Taiwan? Um, I'm not sure for 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 uh, for decades, the United States had the you know the the official strategy of strategic ambiguity or ambiguity. So you know you they they say it's one China, um, so they don't really um, you know recognize Taiwan as a state, but they keep you know some kind of a um, strategic balance. So by trade uh, by um, weapon sales for example um so i don't think that i don't think that china and the united states would really risk con, con, risk a military conflict over taiwan i don't see it um but um well you never know because part of american strategy has this has been this ambiguity you know uh, neither um declaring Taiwan a, a national interest or neither, you know, um, really interfering with Chinese priorities because it's clear that anything China considers belongs to its, you know, own sovereign territory and Taiwan does to it. Um, any, I think any really interference in this regard would lead to military escalation and I'm not, a, I, I don't know if the United States would really want to risk that right now. But I think we will we will see you know what happens in Hong Kong you know could somehow also give insights on what would happen with Taiwan how far you know would the United States like to be pushed back in this regards. Okay, thank you very much for answering all these questions. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So, in the name of the University of Bonn, the Bundeszentrale für politische Bildung in the America House in Cologne, I thank you, Ms. Rotter, for taking the time and sharing your perspective and opinion on the presidential elections and other issues. We really appreciate that you took the time for our lecture and hope we can welcome you next semester or in the next year. Before I want to close the lecture today, I want to point out in two weeks on June 9th, we will have our next lecture, 
Dr. Simone Knewitz, my colleague from the North American Studies program, will talk about populism. The title of the talk will be, I'm the president and you are fake news, populism and the 2020 presidential elections. You are all warmly invited. I hope to see you again in two weeks, same time and more or less same place, comfortable in front of your screen. Um, enjoy the sunny evening. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.